Um, welcome to this afternoon session on a little bit of uh, Project Reactor, Spring Framework 5, and of course Spring Data. My name is Christoph Strobel. I work for Pivotal as a software engineer, and there uh, I'm actually within the Spring Data team responsible for the store abstractions around MongoDB, Redis mainly, and then a little bit of Solar and JPA from time to time. Uh, so that's what I do basically for a living. And I want to kick off this session with a quote from a colleague of mine, actually from Rosson. And what it says is that basically reactive programming uh, is about uh, efficient resource usage in terms of memory and computation power that you have available. It's not necessarily about uh, performance in the first place. Um, we'll come to get that in a little bit of later. And what it also says is that uh, the reactive programming model uh, has this term of back pressure that basically allows clients to signal how much load they can actually take, which is, uh, especially for slow clients, a huge benefit. Um, what you can expect of the next 40 minutes is a little bit of history. I'll keep it really short because we only get 40 minutes. Then we'll have a look at Project Reactor, Spring Data in its K-release, which is the current one, and also, of course, Spring Framework 5 as the baseline to work upon to get all this stuff running. And in the end, I got to show you some code that I prepared because I'm really bad at typing and I don't want to give a bad uh, Josh Long imitation and just fall over my tongue and do all, all that sort of typos along the way. Uh, a bit of recent history. So basically, uh, we as a Spring team uh, started uh, more or less digging really into the reactive space and doing our first development efforts back in 2015 during Spring 1 platform uh, back those days because uh, then we had the chance as a team to get together to really discuss on-site what we're going to do for, as well as Spring Framework 5 and the reactive story. And it didn't take us too long, so actually it was already in July uh, when we had the first milestones out uh, back those days based on Reactor 3.0. Uh, and we already had some, some first support for the reactive story in, as well as the, the Spring data stores for MongoDB and Redis, as well as in Spring Framework 5 itself for uh, a reactive uh, web framework, so to speak. Uh, a bit more recent history, so we got Java 9 release out, and uh, shortly afterwards we had uh, also Reactor 3.1 GA and Spring Framework 5, both uh, both are totally compatible with the Java 9 release. Um, Spring Framework 5 uh, especially uh, has raised its uh, minimum Java version requirements to Java 8. Uh, so this is basically the minimum requirement you have to fulfill to get this, all this working. Uh, so, uh, so is it the same for Reactor? And uh, there have been quite a, a few breaking API changes migrating from 3.0 to 3.1. Uh, concerning Reactor itself, but now we have reached a point where we say uh, the API of Reactor itself is kind of stable and is going to be maintained uh, in the long term. Uh, recently we also released Spring Data K, uh, which has all the reactive stuff and repositories. I'm going to show a little bit later included. And of course today uh, I'm very excited to be here for the first time. Uh, we got this amazing conference uh, where I can actually show you what we've been working on and uh, designing for the so to speak, uh, past two years already. And then a little bit of outlook into the future. Hopefully there will be soon uh, a Spring Boot uh, 2.0 release, so you can expect uh, an RC early December roundabout, and we'll see how that, how that works out and when the DGA release then effectively will be. There's already milestones of Spring Boot 2 out already that have uh, Spring Framework 5, Reactor and the Spring Data stuff included. So if you want to go check it out, you can do so already and even the demo is already based on those milestones. So let's have a look at the imperative applications that we're basically used to write on a daily basis, uh, at least most of us are. And what this is, this is a, a typical REST controller that you can find in a, in a Spring-powered application. So it's got just a, a simple Spring Data repository in it, and it uh, just outputs the find result that we have here. 
as a list and a JSON value. So this is pretty straightforward, and if you're using Spring already, you should be familiar with those concepts. And basically what you get with this concept is you, you're in total control. So you get your Spring Boot application basically. You get some, some kind of event happening, maybe a user interaction or machine-to-machine -machine communication that comes along. And then normally you have to deal with some kind of back-end stores. You fetch data and normally there is some kind of potentially slow stuff in there. And then you got some faster data sources that you got uh, stuff uh, to fetch out too potentially process all that together and then return it to the client. Um, so actually at this end, the thread is just waiting for the result from the database to come back and do, do all that stuff. But it's very easy to understand because you, you have a control flow that you can go through in your code and it's pretty easy. Uh, but you may end up uh, with a lot of threads actually as the, there are more users connecting, you may end up with a lot of threads piling up on your potentially web server. So what this feels like is basically when your house is on fire in the past basically, and there was this lake and you were basically alone and you had just one bucket and you were running back and forth to just put out the fire. Uh, so this is just uh, one, one example that you might compare with. What we've come up with over the time is basically, okay, what can we do about this? So we could fetch more data up front, so we batch stuff in there. And what we actually do by batching up stuff is we actually increase the load on the server in terms of memory, because we got more stuff in memory at the time uh, being. And so if you're in the cloud environment and you have to pay for memory, this might be an issue for you. And what this feels like is basically uh, you're still alone running back and forth, but you increase the weight. So you might be a little bit slower in running, still you can get more, more water poured onto the fire to just put it out. Uh, so it might be a bit more efficient for that case. And of course, we, we dealt with asynchronous stuff. So uh, just adding a bunch of threads, uh, doing stuff in parallel, and then just gathering all the results back together and potentially handing it over. And this feels like, yeah, you just hope that some, some neighbors are coming over with their buckets and help you put out the fire so everyone is running back and forth. And you still have to coordinate yourself to not step on either, each other's toes and, and whatnot. So this is uh, actually how we uh, dealt with that uh, problem in the past or are still doing. And uh, all those scenarios are, are valid uh, today. And uh, they are even valid for many, many, many applications that we'll write in the future because they're simply sufficient for the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, but reactive, uh, think of the cloud environment where you have to pay for threads and, and memory and all that stuff. Uh, when you think about reactive, you basically have to step back a bit and have to look at the problem from another level. And we're then basically talking about, on the one side, a publisher that can give you data and a subscriber that basically demands the data from the publisher. And in between, uh, what they do is they exchange a flow of data. So once the subscriber uh, subscribes to the publisher, uh, the publisher starts handing over elements once they become available. Uh, so when we, and of course, we got this, this tiny little knob up there, which is simulates the back pressure, so the subscriber can tell how many, how many items to fetch uh, and how many it can handle. So if we go back to our example of putting out the fire, basically this would be uh, a line of people just uh, yeah, lined up and handing over the buckets with water just to the other one. So this would basically just, uh, you got it off, your hand pretty pretty fast and this is pretty efficient because you basically keep the memory low. This is uh, goes, goes on pretty fast. And of course what you can also do is basically uh, the last one over here. If he's not fast enough in just pouring water onto the uh, onto the fire, it can basically signal back, and this is basically back pressure, that hey I can't handle that much load. Please slow down a little bit in giving me new new items because I'm kind of tired or whatever and need to be exchanged. Um, so this would be the, the terms of back pressure. Signaling the client signals to the server, I can't handle that load, uh, please slow down. 
the one thing I want you to remember from this rather quick introduction to reactive programming is is that we're going in the imperative world. We, we got this uh, notation of iterators from polling, so you actively call next or on futures, you call get. So this is basically a poll principle. You go there and ask for something. While on the other hand, uh, in the reactive world, we completely changed this to a, uh, to a push metaphor. Because uh, basically, the publisher calls the subscriber with the on next method and hands in the next element when it's available. So this is a paradigm shift in, in some case. Okay, let's have a look at Reactor 3.1. Uh, anyone familiar with reactive streams and the specification? Yeah, one, two, okay. So, uh, at least some in the room, that's very good. Uh, so basically, Reactor uh, is based upon a specification, a reactive stream specification that consists of four four interfaces in the TCK, so this isn't, isn't really uh, that much. And what it defines is it defines basically this concept uh, behind uh, all that stuff. So it basically defines a publisher that can emit a sequence of elements. It defines the subscriber that is able to consume that stuff. And it also defines the subscription, which is actually the handshake between the publisher and the subscriber uh, for the time being. And of course, there are some processing stages, uh, so you can manipulate data and whatnot, which is called the processors. And in Project Reactor, uh, uh, since the, the publishers don't have any meaning of how many items they would emit, this is, just, this is just a stream. A publisher can give you zero elements or it can give you an infinite stream, you never know. Uh, so what Project Reactor, as an implementation of the reactive stream specification, comes up with is basically two main types. And one of those is the flux type that has already the notion of, uh, of elements it will emit. So a flux is defined as zero or n element. Might also be a, an infinite streams. And uh, the flux type also offers you a lot of... Uh, convenience methods on top of the existing API that you'd get with the reactive streams. And uh, there is another type which is called the mono, which is obviously a zero or exactly one element. And uh, when you think of your method signatures, then it makes perfectly sense to have something like a flux in the mono. Because uh, when you think about the find all by last name method, there is probably more than one person with the same la exact same na last name. So it makes sense to return a flux at this point. While on the other hand, emails tend to be unique. So uh, within your method signature, you want to express those cardinalities and just return a mono because there might be one or no person with that given email address. So it makes sense. And if you uh, are kind of wondering why it's called a flux and stuff, um, there is a reason why uh, we chose that name. And the reason is, if you look at the, the method signatures again and the uh, generic types, then you see that those have both exactly four characters and even the method names really align nicely so that your eye doesn't get disturbed while you basically read through the code and uh, method signatures within an interface. And what we in the Spring team and ecosystem basically call this is this Jurgenized, because uh, he's the one guy that really cares about this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, good. Let's jump into reactive applications with uh, Spring Framework 5, Project Reactor, and Spring Data K. And what we try to do, as we always try within the Spring uh, ecosystem, is we, we give you an opportunity to express basically new functionality uh, with a minimal fluff and surprise. And when you actually look at Spring 5 web flux then, and the REST controller and the repository, then to me, this looks pretty much like a deja vu. Because uh, we obviously got this annotation that we are familiar with. We got this uh, notion of uh, repositories that we might already know from the imperative repositories. And the only thing that really changes is that now we just return, instead of a list of flux, and that the, uh, that the 
media type that we want to expose changes to tell Webflux how to actually render render that to the output stream. I'll show you that in the demo that uh, this is actually essential to what you want to achieve and do with Webflux. Uh, digging a bit uh, down uh, into, let's say, the repository and uh, the personal repository, then basically uh, what it boils down to is that uh, for Spring Data, all you have to do instead of just having a CRUD repository, you just add uh, the re extend the reactive CRUD repository, which allows you to basically do just the same things as with the imperative style. So you get a bunch of methods up front, and you can also have derived methods from the uh, you can also derive queries from the method name. So and again, only basically the return type uh, that you'll see is the one thing that changes despite the execution model uh, behind the scenes. Uh, so basically you can have all those derived queries with find by last name, returning fluxes. You can even pass in a deferred argument via a mono, provided later when it gets available, the query gets executed and returns. Uh, you can also, of course, use any query annotations that are already in place and that you're familiar with from the imperative uh, world. Those will work perfectly fine even in, uh, when you're doing uh, reactive stuff. There is one difference, though, uh, within the paging. So basically, define in the imperative world, providing a pageable arg argument would allow it to, to receive a page so that you can ask for, is there a next page uh, or has there been a previous page and which offset did I currently read from, from the underlying store. Uh, with reactive, we decided to not have something like a reactive page because this would be yet another type and how would it behave uh, if you'd, if you'd want to get the, the total count of items if the execution is actually deferred. So what this pageable argument is actually for is to pass down uh, potential sorting parameters or offsets that you want to re start reading from to the underlying data store that those can be processed directly within the store. So like uh, reading offsets in MongoDB starting at element 100, you can do that via that pageable uh, argument. You can also, if you don't need paging and just sorting, just pass in sort and it will work perfectly fine. As I already told you, the, the basic repository in its method signature instead of the Imperative types, we're just using the, the reactive counterparts and monos for the safe methods, fluxes for safe alls, uh, and of course, the typical candidates exists by ID and the find all and count methods and the delete bys. So this is what's ac what actually, uh, what you'll get when you use the reactive repository. Uh, below the repository, just just one level down, there is there is those templates, and if you're familiar with Spring, basically uh, you'll you'll know all the the JDBC template, which is just an abstraction directly above some some kind of uh, native API, like uh, in this case the MongoDB Java driver, and again there will be the the imperative counterparts like Mono and all that stuff, and uh, the API really just just looks from the method signatures exactly the same as the imperative one. Below that, we're using in all uh, the Spring Data projects that allow you to have a, a reactive extension, so to speak. We're directly building upon the reactive drivers provided by the database vendors. In this case, I'll just show you uh, the reactive streams-based MongoDB Java drivers. So there is a uh, the reactive streams specification and the MongoDB Java driver took those basically uh, as the baseline. And what you see here is that they offer you something like a find publisher uh, with just a Bison filter. So there you can see there is no notion of how many elements it will return uh, from the method signature, but still uh, it's there. And of course, there is also just a plain publisher because there is no need to find something for the count values. Uh, so basically, we just wrap all, all the reactive stream uh, values that we get from the driver into fluxes because uh, they all match the reactive stream specifications. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward for us to just make use of those uh, transformations and use uh, Project Reactor as a high-level reactive composition library.
Okay, so now this is the last slide before we actually jump into the demo. I want to tell you some, uh, tell you how the internals, more or less, of the reactive stream. So what happens when you subscribe to a publisher? So first we get the publisher. Then you have to define somehow a subscriber and call the subscribe method on the publisher. This creates the handshake, the subscription, uh, basically handling all the lifecycle of uh, this publisher-subscriber uh, combination, because you could define a publisher and subscribe to it multiple times. That's absolutely valid. You can do so. It will create a subscription on every subscribe. Uh, and after the subscription is uh, created, uh, the publisher will call on subscribe on the subscriber, and then nothing more will happen. So basically, then, then it's done for now. Unless uh, this, uh, you start requesting elements from the publisher, and you do so by re calling request on the subscription, and this will signal to the publisher, OK, you can start emitting exactly that amount of elements once they get available, or a signal you're done because there are no more elements. And then, of course, once the elements get available, uh, the publisher will then just pass them on, hand them over to the subscriber, who can do whatever it wants with it. Uh, of course, you shouldn't do any blocking calls in there, because this would basically blow up the whole principle of, uh, of the reactive story. So, so you, what you don't want to have is any blocking calls within your, your uh, reactive flow, so to speak. And of course, there's a processing stage that you can manipulate data with. OK. I got to hurry up a little bit. 40 minutes is not, not that much of time. Let's jump right into the code. Um, so this is a, a normal Spring Boot application, the one you'd get when you go to start.spring.io. So you choose the current milestone of Spring Boot 2, and then you just type in reactive and you basically can see some of the offerings that are already there. So there's Reactive Web, which is Webflux. Then we I'll be using Reactive MongoDB uh, for a start and see what we'll come up with. Um, I've done so already. So this is the, the application. And what it does in first place, it basically has those, those names in there. It creates an infinite stream by just choosing, picking a random name from from all those names of the Starks from Game of Thrones. And then now it gets a little bit more interesting. So what you see here is basically flux.interval. Uh, by the way, can you read it in the back? Otherwise, it can. It's fine. OK. Uh, flux.interval with a duration of one second. So what this does is basically creating an infinite stream again that emits a tick each and every second. And then I want to zip, zip uh, which, is, which allows me to combine two streams. I zip those ticks with the stream of characters or persons that I have there. And then I'm only interested because now I get a tuple of two because I joined basically two streams. And there is uh, T1, uh, T1 is basically the tick, and T2 would be, as it's the second argument, it would be the person that I generated. Um, so it would give me this tuple. I map it because I'm not interested in the tick. I just want to have a, a person per second. So I just take out the person and I save it to the repository. And if we go down there a bit, there is the, the person. And there we have a reactive CRUD repository uh, that has a same safe method defined already. So I'll just save it. And then it gets basically assigned an ID because it doesn't have one before and prints it out to the console. Of course, you wouldn't want to print to the console in, in, an, in a real application, because printing to console is, is a blocking call, so you wouldn't want to do it. Uh, but for the sake of the demo, and just to, to see that there is there's constantly uh, data generated and stored into MongoDB, it is just perfectly fine. And this one down here is, is essential, because without calling subscribe, nothing would happen because I just set up a flow, but I never actually told someone to execute it. So what I have to do is basically I have to subscribe to it. So this is a common mistake. Happens to me all of the time. I forget to call subscribe, and then I'm curious why nothing is happening. So this is, this is really important. And then we just, once the application started, we just print out winter is coming to see that this 
code above is just isn't blocking. Okay, and uh, what I also did, I just added, as I showed you before, exactly a, a person controller that I can call. It just emits the, it just executes a find all by name query and just uh, passes that stuff out as JSON. So let's run this example, making this a little bigger, a little bit bigger. So you can already see here that there is this, this very line, winter is coming, uh, so it's not blocking, and the application had star has already started, and basically every second a new person gets generated and stored into uh, an embedded MongoDB. So the data will be effectively gone every time I restart, uh, restart the application because it's just embedded data, and so I'll lose it every time. Okay, so this is... Uh, Works pretty fine, storing to the database. Now let's see what we can, if we can also retrieve that stuff. So what I'm going to do is I just call, uh, I'll just set up an HTTP call. Let's do it stream uh, on port 8080. We got a name and let's call ARIA. And then, yeah, works as expected. I get uh, the JSON response of the ARIAs currently within the system. Um, this is pretty neat, uh, but what you actually, since we got uh, underlining, since we, we got a flow basically down here that is emitted, what you'd expect is to be uh, that the elements get rendered one by one, actually. So as soon as they become available, they, they'll get rendered each snippet, so to speak, is each JSON fragment should be rendered, rendered one by one until we're done and then uh, basically the response should be closed. And we can simulate that uh, by just, uh, we call, I still got time, please tell me I got time. Uh, we call delay elements and then we do a duration of seconds and let's say we will just pause the the emitting of each and every element by, by one second one, once we execute uh, this operation. So if I start this again, you can see that there is already two adders in there. And once I now call adders, what you see is that it took quite some time. I guess it took two seconds or so, because uh, this actually didn't work as you would have expected, because it basically waited all the time till all elements got available, and then the JSON stream got flushed to the output stream, which isn't exactly what, what we wanted to do. But we wanted to have them come in basically uh, as they are emitted. So I'll leave this just here and change the get mapping up here to not, uh, by default, it would uh, just emit a media type of application JSON. But what I actually want to have, it, it produces a media type, media type of application JSON stream. I just have to add the value in here because it takes a string uh, on the annotation. Okay, so let's see if we can do better. Now, actually, what we are now doing, we're telling WebFlux how to render the response, actually. Oh, there's two ARIAs already. Um, so let's call it for ARIA. ARIA. And okay, it waits on the first element, and then every second, basically, as we delayed it uh, by intention, one chunk gets rendered at the time once it gets available. So this is, uh, this is uh, very neat uh, and very handy if you want, just want to pass on data very fast to your client. Once you got the first results, just pass them out and let the UI do whatever it wants uh, uh, with the data available. There is, uh, Stefan Nicole has actually a pretty neat demo showing exactly that stuff uh, in combination with Timelith 3 and their reactive story in there. So this is, uh, you can really build uh, absolutely cool stuff with that. Gotcha, ten more, ten more minutes. Let's jump on. Anyone in the room likes uh, who likes RxJava or already uses it? Yeah, the pretty much the same people knowing about directive stream stuff. Um, I'll just jump a bit further. Okay. 
So once we now look down at the repository, it's pretty easy if you don't want to opt into reactor types in your API uh, to use RxJava types that you're already familiar with. So you can do so by just declaring the return type of a method as an observable, which is a, a, an RxJava type, and it will work just the way it did with the, with the flux. You can even use it uh, within the method signature in your controller, so it's pretty pretty straightforward to just uh, use whatever reactive composition library you're into, because as long as those, uh, those comply to the reactive stream specification, uh, we are fine with it and can wrap and unwrap uh, those types according to your needs. So this will work. And another thing that I wanted to show you is basically uh, those who are working with MongoDB may have heard of something like uh, a capped collection, which is a, a collection of limited size, and uh, those capped collections have a specialty because uh, they allow you to open up a, a tailable cursor with which you can basically have an infinite stream, and every once in a while, data gets inserted into the collection, you get, uh, you get it pushed to the client via, via this, uh, this open cursor. And uh, you can make use of those tailable cursors with Spring Data already uh, by just defining a method and adding the add tailable annotation in there. And for the reactive story, this is very handy because on the one side you can just uh, ha open up uh, one cursor and then just emit the stuff or multicast the stuff out to any client that may, may there connect to your endpoint. Let's see how this works. Uh, I already set up the collection up here. Uh, and please note, I don't do it in a reactive way because this is the start of the application. So there is no need for me to just uh, for tasks that I have to do anyway up front when my application starts up. Uh, I just use the imperative template as it's way more straightforward. I just call template create collection. So there is no need for me to be reactive there in first place. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, okay, uh, and then I just have this very one method. I have my endpoint that basically uh, produces an, a text event stream as media type. So this basically allows me to, to create server sent events that are pushed out to the client. And then I just call the method down here, and this is actually still still in the code, which is uh, not quite correct. Uh, but you just call the defined by method and just pipe it out. So let's see how that works. Come on, let me please. Thank you. Starting. So on the one hand, we got here, uh, again, data piped into our database. And now we're going. This is to. We're going to just stream the data to this endpoint via an event stream. And you can see the, the data is is loaded, and then constantly as it's pushed into the saved in the database, it basically gets pushed out via the open cursor throughout uh, the Spring Data API and Webflux directly to the client. So this is just just an infinite stream. Um, one thing uh, you have to, to note is that once I, let me just quickly make this a little bit better, bigger, HTTP 8080 uh, slash stream, and of course I have to stream. Uh, once I, I connect to this endpoint again, you can see down here that it will open up uh, another database connection. Uh, so why did this happen, actually? Because uh, we got this flux here that streams the person, and basically this method gets invoked every time a client connects to that endpoint. So it's pretty pretty obvious that now a second cursor gets open, and this is probably not what you want to do. But maybe you just want to share your already open connection and just close it when, when all the clients basically disconnect. Uh, that's pretty easy to do. Five more minutes, gotta hurry up. Um, and I just, let me just quickly remove that one. So we got a, now we create a constructor and copy 
this code. Let's copy it. So we create a flux of person. Uh, let's call it X. And we define X as find by ID. And also we can add this handy little method share down here, which comes from Project Reactor. And what this does, it basically increases the threshold to one. So the flux won't be closed unless all, all, all subscribers basically unsubscribe from it. So if there is another subscriber, it will just reuse, reuse the flux and all it has in there, and, but won't close it once, once uh, one of the subscribers disconnects. I hope, and now of course I have to return turn this here, stop it, and restart. Yeah. So, okay, we got it emitting again. So what we got here is, again, and down there, there is the, uh, there is the database connection that, that got just opened, and once we now connect with another client, you can see there is obviously nothing happening down there. So we are basically now with one open connection to the deba database, we are streaming, multicasting to multiple clients at the same time, which is kind of handy. Gotcha. This is actually an error coming from the MongoDB Java driver. We've got nothing to do with it. This is just, they, they got some, some exception down there when closing properly. Still isn't fixed. Um, one last thing, since I only got two or three minutes left. Let's fast forward. Uh, oops, and down here, git co. Uh, actually, two things. Uh, one would be testing, because um, it's always always about testing. Because somehow you have to verify your code is correct. And Reactor comes with uh, with an artifact called Reactor Test that comes with the step verifier that basically gives you all the means you need to test your your reactive flow and application. So you can say basically, uh, step verifier create for a given flux. So this would be repository safe, save something. And you expect that at least uh, uh, it returns exactly one value and then uh, the the, uh, the the complete signal is is ex uh, is emitted, and you can also save uh, create test your let's say find function. Just take one at a time to uh, to make it easier, and then you can have consume next with, and then just use whatever assertion library you want to use to verify uh, the values that you get back uh, from the execution chain and again verify complete to just have the complete signal emitted or if you expect an error verify that there is an error with a certain message and whatnot there's there's really uh, a lot of support in there to just make it easy to test test all that stuff and for spring 5 I still got also one more thing yeah, there is, there is also a, a, a web client, a reactive one that comes with Spring 5 that lets you easily consume that stuff. It's just called web client. And you can just create it for a bit bigger, please. You can just give it an endpoint, basically point it somewhere, call get, give it a URI with the query parameter, call retrieve, and then basically as you get a flux back, uh, or a flow back, you say, okay, map that stuff into a flux because this is just the JSON representation. So every time you get one chunk of JSON, just uh, convert it, whatever uh, mapping library you're using, into a person and then subscribe. Again, please don't use a blocking stuff, uh, but this is the very easiest subscriber you can potentially have. Just print it out to the console. This will work pretty fine. And for those of you who are really into functional programming, there is something called uh, Webflux FN, which lets you, instead of uh, the controller-based model with the annotations, lets you define router functions like this. So you basically say, route, give it a, res a request uh, predicate for the, for the path. So this would be get on something, and then you would just call uh, use a method reference to call something on a person controller. Actually, this would be flux persons. And there you go on and say, okay, 
we, I want to have a server response that signals, OK, in its body, please just render the flux as, as you go. And again, what you'd have to set is the, the content type. In this case, it would be media type application JSON by default, but you want to have the media type that, uh, no, application stream JSON. So you would set the application type correctly to just signal back, OK, render those uh, snippets, snippets of JSON w once they come along and just just with the way I want it to, to have. For XJava, it's a bit more complicated because uh, Spring Web Flux FN isn't capable of directly handling the RxJava type, so you would have to intermediate push in there this publisher adapter that lets you convert uh, the, the RxJava type just into a Flux. And with that, a little bit over time, just one minute, uh, I want to close this session more or less by uh, telling you that uh, Reactive is ex uh, actually no free lunch, though it looks very familiar uh, and is backed by really great framework support. Uh, you still have to pay for it, and the price is often complexity because once you get into debugging those uh, reactive flow chains, uh, you'll find yourself very easily in trouble. So please, before you actually just do reactive because you can think about if it's necessary for your needs and your application. And with that, I'm around today, tomorrow. Just come talk to me, and thanks for listening. <laughs>